So hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today in this uh, UK edition of the webinar uh, to gain insights on uh, leveraging product price monitoring and competitor tracking as uh, strategic tools for uh, retail businesses. I'm Girish Kumar, uh, Vice President Retail and uh, CPG at uh, JK Tech. I lead the domain consulting industry advisory products and platform solutions. I come with more than uh, two decades of uh, experience in uh, transforming uh, retail organizations, providing uh, digital omni-channel supply chain and uh, analytics uh, solutions. I uh, welcome you to this uh, webinar uh, to learn how uh, competitor benchmarking and uh, pricing intelligence can help uh, the strategic agility of retail businesses. Uh, and, and this webinar will help you understand more about tracking competitor prices, uh, repricing at scale, uh, assortment validation, tracking price compliance, and uh, uh, much more. So the main uh, speaker for today's uh, webinar is uh, Kishore Rajgopal, uh, who is the subject matter uh, expert for retail and analytics at uh, JK Tech. Kishore comes with uh, over 20 years of experience in consulting, uh, product development, uh, business development, analytics, and uh, uh, BI, and has a uh, deep domain expertise uh, in retail and uh, as well as brands. Uh, our guest speaker for today, uh, Robert Gare, uh, is the Chief Information Officer at uh, AF Blackmore and Sun Limited. Uh, Robert is a strategic IT leader uh, operating at board level in the UK, Europe, and uh, Asia. He comes with uh, an excellent track record of uh, uh, leading business transformation programs and uh, delivering uh, multiple business applications. We will uh, greatly benefit from uh, his 35 years of uh, uh, industry experience and a wealth of uh, knowledge he has gathered over the years. Uh, we also have uh, Taruk Ahmed uh, on the panel today. Uh, Taruk is a senior uh, data scientist with a uh, deep understanding of uh, uh, apparel and fashion retail uh, segment. Uh, he has uh, extensively worked on uh, providing uh, planning, markdowns, and uh, uh, pricing solutions to various uh, retailers. Uh, Kishore, Robert, and Taruk, uh, I'm very happy to uh, welcome you uh, to the panel. Thank you, Grish. Good afternoon. Um, I would share my deck and uh, we would take it from there. I will, uh, let me set a context uh, quickly for the audience. Um, so in the meantime, so talking about the, uh, you know, uh, the context of the webinar, uh, as the, as the post pandemic uh, uh, economy takes uh, shape, uh, CIOs are, uh, you know, uh, evolving uh, their IT mission uh, to shape their businesses. From a, a retail business perspective, uh, an optimized price can be one of the key factors uh, influencing their uh, uh, customer purchase decisions. And, and uh, retailers can increase uh, margins by uh, adjusting prices at the right time, at the right place, and, and maintaining a competitive position in the market. Through, through experience, we have uh, observed an increase in retail GMV uh, by, by 6% and also an improvement in margins by uh, an extent of 10%. As, as industries evolve uh, due to uh, rapid changes, uh, CIOs are uh, uh, combining historical data with, with uh, statistical modeling, uh, data mining techniques, and, and machine learning. Uh, to make uh, decisions that improve the bottom lines, right? Uh, with the with the spend on uh, data-driven strategies and uh, uh, advanced analytics solutions, uh, so which are going growing very significantly. Uh, so we are we are glad to bring uh, to you one of the top use cases uh, uh, in the retail today. So we will discuss about how uh, price optimization solutions have been uh, uh, successful to retailers uh, through a tailored approach. And, and how retailers have been able to uh, achieve timely markups, timely markdowns, uh, increased uh, basket size, and also uh, reduced price management effort and so on uh, by, by frequently monitoring uh, product prices and, and making appropriate adjustments uh, based on AI-driven recommendations and competitive benchmarking. So uh, without uh, taking much time, uh, let me uh, now transfer the floor to uh, uh, Kishore, uh, so uh, Kishore, uh, can you talk about uh, the price monitoring and competitor benchmarking in the in the present day business environment? 
take us through the, uh, the thoughts and uh, you know help us understand this you know much better over to you kishore Thank you so much, Girish, uh, for setting the context. It's an exciting time. Uh, a lot of inflation, a lot of volatility, a lot of change. Retailers see a lot of challenges in being able to keep up to the market. It's not enough if you adjust prices occasionally. You got to monitor the environment, your competitors. You got to see what's going on. And you got to be able to make ch changes very frequently. Uh, depending on the category, depending on the situation, very often, sometimes several times in a day. So yeah, without the right price, the right moment is not going to happen. You may have the best offering, the best quality, the best attributes, but people really look out for prices. They research, even in a store, they switch on their cell phones, and get to the right, right products and figure out the right prices. And only then they close on a decision. This, this is well researched. And as, as we've already spoken, this accelerated digitization, volatility, inflation, um, unpredictable supply chains, gaps between supply and demand. So it's not business as usual. Um, okay. So I've stored my voice is not, is, is not low. How, how is it? Girish, Robert, how's my voice now? It's fine. It's fine. I'll try to speak louder uh, as, as given feedback that the, my voice is low. So yeah, uh, a, a lot of uh, a churn out there, right? There's, there's COVID, but COVID has forced digitization. Digitization means you can change prices more often. Uh, an industry like the restaurant that changed prices once in a quarter after digitization, they can change prices monthly, weekly, sometimes daily. So uh, others like electronics change prices four times a day. You gotta be on top of things. Um, so, uh, so really real-time repricing is key to winning in e-commerce. And that's where we're headed to. Um, also, uh, we've spoken about uh, uh, you know, machine learning methods uh, and all these methods learn from history. Um, but the last two years is, is all data that's that's not valid data. There have been ups and downs, there have been churns, there's been shutdowns, there's been total you know, lockdowns in cities and, and states. So all of the data is not reusable. So you can't really build normal tithing series models on top of that. You've got to be able to adjust it uh, for to account for those for those factors. So we feel our, our perspective is, is the understanding your competition, their prices, their markdowns, their scenarios, their attributes, their assortment. And keeping pace with that is is one of the best ways to win. I mean, you gotta be on top of it, I feel. Uh, now, uh, in the past, we had what's called price elasticity modeling. So, so a lot of organizations pulled in point of sale data, built price elasticity models, and, and came down with what is called a, a, a demand supply match curve, and then put a price on that. Now, those models, they still need it, but they're giving way to what I would say is a market-driven pricing. So demand-driven pricing versus market-driven pricing. And the best enterprises obviously would combine the two ways to be able to, uh, to, be able to price it. Not to mention, <coughs> not to forget is there's a lot of external data, local events, national events, uh, density of population, migration, any local uh, you know, carnivals you have, they need to be accounted for when you uh, do your pricing. So as Girisha has already mentioned, one of our clients increased their GMV by 6% by watching competition and not blindly, but intelligently matching competitor prices. Now, this, is, this sounds interesting, let's talk further. So the problem statement we have spoken, uh, real-time competitive insights is necessary. Uh, customer attention is poor because there's very little, you know, loyalty, there's very little stickiness. So prices are going to be important. Uh, brand compliance monitoring, you have a brand, you have an equity, you want to maintain that. You want to make sure that uh, people don't, you know, mark you down lesser on various channels for reasons of convenience. Um, so yeah, I, I think one of the most thing is the right velocity of change of prices, depending on the category and depending on the specific sub vertical, you got to determine that right velocity. So this is uh, 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 our way of explaining, uh, you know, uh, conscious versus unconscious 
pricing decisions and uncompetitive versus competitive. So yeah, if you're if you're unconsciously uncompetitive, that's chaotic. You you don't know what's going on. And if you're unconsciously competitive, that means you're blindly matching prices. That is called a race to the bottom. That's not much fun. But if you're conscious, you're aware of competition, and you choose to be, let's say, the best and the, the lowest in the market, that's a conscious positioning choice. So maybe you're pumping in capital to, to gain market share, for example. Um, unconsciously, consciously being competitive, which means you choose certain areas where you compete in certain areas, you choose, you know, it's okay to have higher prices. That's where I know I can still make it. So it's this. This is a positioning uh, thing, which which is for us to look at. Uh, we'll we'll spend a few minutes on why competitor benchmarking is is going to be important. Um, so you, uh, you know, compare yourself with identified competitors and sometimes unidentified competitors. Um, this product equivalence mapping, the discovery of new products, this discovery of new competitors. You discover new deals, new markdowns. You discover uh, new attributes that are coming in. Uh, identify similar products that in the client's eyes are, are the same as far as the client needs are concerned. And how do we do this? Um, there's, a, there's an elaborate process. There's this collation, gathering, cleansing, QA, enriching annotation, structuring, adding a business perspective to it, visualizing it, and then making it ready for action. I mean, um, so competitor A, what's their assortment increase in the last three months compared to you? Competitor B, how many categories are there lower than you in the last month? These are the kind of insights you need to really tackle competition. So um, we will go through some case studies uh, and then we'll also go through a demo here. Um, so Tarok, uh, could you take us through the specific client case study and then through a demo of our platform, Tarok? Sure, sure. Uh, if you could move on to the next slide, the case, case study slide. Yes, that's the one, right? Yeah, if, if you could go to the previous slide, that'd be great. Yeah, so here, uh, hello everyone. Uh, so here I want to talk about this specific client of ours that we have been working with for the past uh, one and a half years. Uh, this particular client that we speak of is based in the APAC region and uh, they deal primarily with the uh, selling of alcohol products uh, on their store. Uh, this client had a huge presence uh, in the airport stores uh, of Singapore and Malaysia, uh, specifically in the, in the APAC region. And when the pandemic hit, uh, their sales took a big hit as well. The entire uh, travel industry was shut down. There was not a lot of uh, transit happening. And because of this, uh, their stores took a huge hit. And these people, they decided to pivot their business uh, to their e-commerce segment or the sector. But the problem with doing so was that they were very new to the e-commerce sector and they did not have any idea as to uh, how they need to approach the pricing problem that they faced with regards to the pricing of their products on their platform. Uh, so they came to us uh, during the pandemic uh, uh, seeking help in regards to two problems. Uh, the first problem being uh, understanding the assortment of their competitors in the market. The Singapore uh, alcohol market is highly saturated and they wanted to understand if they were selling the right products on their platform. That was the first problem statement. And the second problem statement was that they wanted to understand if they were selling their products at the right price. So uh, what we did uh, with this particular uh, client of ours is we identified 10 competitors that are highly relevant to their business in the alcohol segment in the Singapore market. And we got uh, the assortment of all of the uh, alcohol products on each of these uh, respective competitors and we made an analysis on which of these products are very, high, very highly rele relevant to our client. We made uh, analysis based on the uh, number of brands that their competitors are selling, the assortment of products within these brands, their brand popularity, the product popularity, the customer reviews for each of these uh, products and we were able to provide a report to our clients 
which highlighted which of these brands need to be onboarded onto the client's platform and which of the brands and products that are already there on the client's platform are missing on the other competitors platform. This gave them an understanding as to how they can leverage the competitive advantage with regards to selling of the specific products that were very uh, special to uh, their platform and how to tackle the pricing for the products that were not present on their platform and acquire them and uh, appropriately price them so as to stay competitive uh, in the pricing market uh, with respect to their products. The second problem that uh, they were facing was they did not know if the products that they were already there on their platform were being sold at the right price. For this, we tracked the prices of all of these products across the competitors. And uh, what we did is we tracked them for a, a defined set of time and we were able to benchmark what is the optimal price at which these products need to be sold onto that platform. Now, I'd like to take you through a demo that we've built. Uh, this is, I wouldn't call it a demo. This is a working, uh, this is a working uh, product that the client is currently using. And I would like to take you through that. Uh, is my screen visible? Yeah, Tarok. Yeah, uh, just go ahead. Yeah, you can share your screen and proceed. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. So this is a part. Uh, this is the dashboard that we have uh, uh, built for our client, and this dashboard is highly tailored to the needs of our client that we speak of. Uh, this dashboard shows the number of total number of products that are currently present on the client's platform, and this number of active SKUs that we're actively monitoring for these clients, and uh, this. A particular card indicates to us what are the SKUs that are competitively priced on the client's platform. In this particular scenario, as per the client's definition, uh, the, the products that are priced the lowest on their platform are considered as the competitive SKUs. And obviously this definition might vary from client to client, but since this particular uh, dashboard is tailored to our client's needs, uh, this particular card is indicating the most competitive SKUs as per their definition, which is the lowest priced SKUs on their platform. And the last card indicates to us the number of competitors that we're tracking for this particular client. Uh, moving on uh, in the dashboard, we have this section called the price gap analysis, which again is uh, very highly tailored for the needs of the client. This is indicating to them the products that are priced the highest on their platform, the products that are priced lowest on their platform indicated by the last card. And this particular card indicates the products that are priced in between, neither highest nor the lowest but at a price uh, somewhere in between across the spectrum for that particular product on the market. And this particular table is indicating to us for the products that are priced the highest, which is 286, how many of them are, have a price difference of between zero to 5% with respect to the next highest priced uh, competitor price, uh, five to 10%, 10 to 15% and greater than 20% and so on. And this is compared with respect to the next highest priced competitor, as well as the average market price for that particular product. And the same analysis is being done for the products that are priced the lowest on the platform as well. If in case we want to look at which of these products are priced the highest or the lowest, you want to take a look, quick look and uh, augment the prices of those products. All you need to do is you need to click on these tabs and you'll be able to get a list of all of those products. You'll be able to download them as a CSV and you'll be able to get a list of all of those products and uh, augment their prices on the go. Uh, the next part of the dashboard is indicating to us uh, the assortment comparison with respect to each of the platforms from which we are getting the prices. Uh, you can see that uh, we have three separate bars here which indicate to us the products that are priced lowest, the products that are priced equal and the products that are priced the highest in comparison to that particular platform. And we also have a table that indicates to us when was the last time the products were uh, fetched from each of these platforms, the percentage of assortment match with respect to these platforms, and also the percentage of products that are priced low, equal, or high with respect to the products that are mapped onto these platforms. We have a few other functions like uh, being able to upload the products onto the platform itself that we provide to the customer, wherein which they'll be able to upload the uh, onboard this new SKUs onto the platform themselves and start tracking of those products on the go which is done from the section. Now, if you want to look at the products at a much more granular level, uh, what we can do is we can go into the product view 
of the platform and that allows us to take a look at the products at a much more granular level. The level of granularity uh, is uh, can be controlled uh, with the set of our with the help of our time series graphs. So this particular uh, view uh, gives us a quick view of what is happening across the uh, platforms. Uh, this particular distribution will be able to uh, help us quickly understand how the products are pri priced across these platforms. And if we want to see how the products have been varying the past few days, all we can all we need to do is click on Show Trend, and that will take us to the product page. And on the product page, we'll be able to see how the product's uh, price has been varying uh, across the platforms in the past uh, seven days, 14 days, so on and so forth. In some cases, uh, we, we may want to verify if the product's uh, price is being scraped uh, right off the platform. And for that, we have the links for that particular product uh, mentioned over here as well. So all we need to do is if we need to verify the if the product's price is being scraped properly, we just need to click on that link and it takes us to that particular page and we'll be able to verify if the price is right or wrong. What 9.68 and that is the price that we see over here. Now this is uh, just one part of uh, the exercise that we did for them. Uh, once we have these insights, what we do from the back end is uh, we, we, we built a, a recommendation uh, based on the prices that we uh, see on the platform for that particular product. Uh, for this particular uh, product, what uh, the kind of pricing that we recommend is called the market driven pricing, wherein we're only taking into account uh, the market prices of that particular uh, product. And depending on that, uh, we are recommending the optimal price at which that product needs to be sold. Uh, if we also have the uh, demand data or the POS or transaction data that is available, uh, we integrate that into our models as well. And uh, we, we come up with a hybrid approach uh, that takes into account both the market driven and demand driven uh, pricing approach to be able to recommend the optimal prices at which the product needs to be sold. Uh, that is pretty much it from my end with regards to the case study. Kishore, over to you. Thank you. Uh... Arok, if you can, uh, I'll just share one more slide and then we leave it open for questions. If you can uh, um, stop sharing. So the one more slide is, is really this, right? Um, so there are many different ways to leverage um, market-driven pricing approaches, um, understanding competitors' range of prices, products, new attributes, price variations of various channels, um, the other day I was speaking to a, uh, another a partner of ours in Europe and uh, understanding how currency fluctuations impact us. In some situations, our, our prices uh, become very competitive in a market because of currency fluctuation, but it's not profitable. <laughs> that market is not worth pursuing. How do you suddenly uh, benchmark all of that on a regular basis and decide what to continue, what to sort of pause, uh, assortment analytics, assortment gaps by category. Uh, what are the new attributes that are trending? Um, brand protection is, is I have, as a brand, I have certain policies in terms of minimum prices or discounts or markdowns. So I want to be able to control that by monitoring and promotion analytics. You know, what are the promos that are running out there where we need to sort of consider and sort of match? Um, overall benefits, yeah, better pricing decisions, keeping breast of products, avoiding the race to the bottom, better uh, brand equity, but most important, better conversions, better profitability. Uh, so with that, uh, I, I would, oh gosh, uh, was I sharing anything at all? <laughs> okay, so with that, I would just leave it open to, uh, to questions. Okay, so uh, that was the... Uh... A great insight and uh, and a perspective on uh, you know adopting competitor benchmarking in the current business environment, uh, including uh, you know the uh, currency fluctuation you talked about more so now you know than ever before, right? Uh, so th thanks for taking us through a, a tailored approach, you know, providing uh, deeper insights on uh, uh, competitors.
So it was also wonderful to learn about uh, the impact on KPIs like GMV, conversion, sales, and so on. You know, that, that, that helps uh, retailers from avoiding, like you rightly said, the race to the bottom. You know, I, I really love that statement. Yeah. So that, that was awesome, uh, uh, Kishore and uh, Taro. Uh, thank you so much for an excellent insight and uh, guiding us in the right direction with, with regards to growth and profitability and, and delivering value through competitor intelligence. Let me let me uh, shift my uh, focus to uh, uh, Robert. So, uh, Robert, uh, having heard from uh, Kishore and Taruk about uh, the background uh, approach and and KPIs and and so on, so we would we would be keen to hear uh, your views on uh, uh, bringing these ideas into action uh, at uh, AF Blackmore or other retail organizations from your experience. You know, so uh, what capabilities do you think retailers like AFB uh, need to bank on? I mean, we've been here at Blakemore's, we've been um, implementing pricing optimization um, for about 18 months now um, since we actually started the uh, started the actual implementation. The journey probably started a little bit before that. Um, I would say it's it's a rich ecosystem. So there's a number of things that that you really have to consider. And um, and and it's important to take the incremental steps to to get to the benefits. Um, for me, you really have to be clear on what your pricing strategies are. And, and and what do I mean by pricing strategies? Well, the obvious ones are you have a minimum margin, a maximum margin. At, at a product level, what's the um, price um, comparison you want to have with your competitors? How many competitors do you want to track against? We're both the retail and the wholesale business, so we have a multi-dimension to that as well. We have different competitors for, for different aspects, whether it's retail or wholesale. Other types of rules that then you start to consider are, do you want to make sure that um, you're pricing alike for flavors of the same product? So here in the UK, you know, we, we eat millions of tons of crisps every year and making sure that all the flavors are the same, the same with yogurts, the same with jams, marmalades, whatever making sure that you're you're not surprising the consumer in your store because all of a sudden one of that range is more expensive or cheaper than the other. Um, the other thing to consider is is good, better, best. And this is really important as well when you when you consider promotions. So if you're selling, let's take the example um, as Tariq was uh, was in in the wines and spirits game, you know, if you if you have a, a wine that is your entry level wine, your medium wine, and then your your special treat high-end wine, how does your pricing compare between the three? If you have a special promotion on any of those three, how does it how does it impact the image of, of the other one? And more importantly, which of those three gives you your stronger margins and where do you want to drive your sales towards? Um, so good, better, best is, is more com complex than people at first realize. Um, simple things like, you know, do you want to end in in historically, you've wanted to end the price in a, a five and a nine for those of us that are pounds and pence or or or, or dollars and, and cents. You know, um, is it a five and nine? Is it a three and a seven? Do you have a strategy and a policy around that so you can take that last 0.1% of margin based on those rules? So they're just a few examples of of the, the the rules around your strategies that you really need to apply. We've done them. We've put them in play and. Our training teams, who are the people who are responsible for managing our range, prices, promotions, um, they get daily, in fact, real-time alerts if one of their actions, and it, or even even it could just be the supply cost price changes, um, but but either their actions or an external force creates an exception um, to those to those rules in the strategy, and therefore they have to take action, and you you monitor make sure they have to take the action. So that's the rules and the strategies. Around data, you're only as good as the accuracy of your data. Um, and I agree I agree that over the last two years, um, the data has been all over the place with the way the world's operated. But fundamentally, you do need your history. You need to make the, the most of your history. You may choose to take the most recent. You may choose to um, exclude the previous two years. In the industry we're in, which is convenience, Actually, we were impacted by the last two years, but probably not as, mo as much as, as as most, certainly those who are in hospitality or fashion or whatever. 
um, you know, we we saw we did see a change, but not not the massive swings that everybody else sees. So personally, we will use that data, but we bear in mind that there may be some um, small anomalies within that data set. Um, one of the real key things for us is how do you define like products? So for us, where we have the same product being supplied in different um, case sizes, which is our wholesale business, yes, we would include those as the same products. If you have a, a fresh fruit, an apple from 15 different suppliers, from a supply chain perspective, you give it a different product code. But the reality is that, that from a retail perspective, it's the same product. So they're obvious ones to group. Where it gets a little bit more complicated, and I guess your 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 business, your industry, um, you know, your industry will choose which is the best way to apply this. But for us, it's always an argument over whether you should include a price mark product and a non-price mark product as the same products. If you're measuring, if if you're measuring forecast demand versus um, elasticity of pricing, etc. Um, the same for a product that might be a standard price, but you, you've got the option to win a holiday on it. You know, should they or shouldn't they be in the same category? And, and only you will know that. Um, the age of the data, I think we talked about the age of the data is, is it's it's on steroids at the moment because inflation is so rampant. But if you've, if you've set your strategy, this is where the, the ecosystem, the rich ecosystem comes into play. So if you've weighted your strategy on, on sorry, another obvious strategy is, is, is the um, price of lights competition, which, which we do do. Depending on how you weight your strategy between minimum margin, maximum margin, some of those standard rules, price versus competition. If you're heavily weighted on price versus competition, but you're only pulling your data from competitors once a week, you could be left behind and selling at a loss in that current week. So it's important that you balance the right speed of your competitive data, plus the weighting you're putting on your pricing strategy for how you are aligning your price to your competitor, or are there more things that are important? For example, at the moment, you might want to put greater weighting on minimum margin if the speed of your competitor's data is slow. Have you got the right promotions indicators on your products? Do you know when they're on promotion? Um, do you know how that's affecting the demand? Do you know how to treat that within the data that's coming for your demand? Has the product been categorized in the right place? So, you know, has somebody put a wine in the spirits? Has somebody put a biscuit in a cake? All of these things can really affect it. And the human errors, that they are just human errors that do affect it. So you really have to make sure that you're, um, you're very strict and disciplined in the way you set your data up. The other thing that we we struggle with is because we are a wholesaler and a retailer, and because of the historical architecture of, of POS systems, um, we're actually in the middle of a rollout and moving to an enterprise um, POS solution. But historically, we've had independent POSs in stores. How do you make sure that the, um, the independent retailer or indeed your own retail staff have not done something locally that affects the quality of your data? in terms of introducing local products, in terms of um, misaligning those products. All of those things can really mess up your data. So it's, it's really important that the data is, is key. So I guess in terms of a long answer, but it's, it's a rich ecosystem. You have to really consider what rules you want to apply to your strategies. Um, you really have to consider the quality of your data and the speed of your data. And the final thing I would say is it's really tempting to go too quickly, but establish a base. So we're currently in the process of establishing our base and it's taken us, you know, a year, a year plus. Um, and then once you're confident with your base, then you can start doing more sophisticated stuff. So then you can start looking at um, elasticity. I, I agree that elasticity is something that's a little bit old fashioned. What it is useful for is to understand which of your products are inelastic and elastic. And then you can um, and then you can choose how you want to categorize them for your your strategies going forward. Um, you can have start having a look at things like the halo effect. So, you know, if you sell, if you've got a, a special offer on dips, uh, have the, have the um, you know, have the sources that are associated with them gone up in price. I'm um, sorry, gone up in demand. Um, so all of these things, you know, the pantry effect, the the impact of forecast future temperatures. But get your base first, get your foundation right first. And that will that will mean you can move into those sophisticated areas. Very long answer there. I do apologize. That was uh, really great, uh, Robert. You know, it was quite interesting. You know, to learn 
uh, about the processing strategies and not surprising the uh, consumers, price elasticities, and and other impactful capabilities with uh, uh, evolving approaches, so to speak, you know, to to pricing uh, like like benchmarking, market drivers, competition. We talked about assortment fitment, you know, and so on. Uh, that that retailers need to really consider in order to uh, ensure a higher ROI. And as you said, you're you're only as good as the data. Yeah, uh, and and even the speed of the data, yeah. So that was that was really wonderful. And uh, so now now following on this, uh, what are what are some of the complexities uh, that as a retailer you need to be aware uh, in this context? Any any specific callouts that you want to make? Yeah, I mean I think the complexities were probably embedded within my first answer. You know, it's 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 making sure that you you really truly understand. Um, how your pricing rules need to be applied, you know, and and that can be complex. Um, making sure that your data is accurate, that can be complex. So I think they were embedded in my first question, um, in my first answer to, to, to the initial question. Um, I think other complexities to be aware of is um, new entrants to the marketplace. So, um, you know, we've We've seen the, the the rise of the immediate convenience uh, retailer in 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 the UK marketplace. Pricing wise, they're generally higher, but the true value to the to the consumer, you know, they don't they don't have to in, um, have a fuel cost. They don't have to have loss of time, etc. And their own personal time, you know, what's the cost of that? What's the price of that? Um, so there's the constantly changing marketplace we're in, which, as I say, we've we've seen is 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 very strong. Um, so you know, I'd say yeah. So it's it's about setting your strategies. It's about making sure your data is right, is your data accurate, whether it's third party or created within, and then the the changing face of the marketplace you're in, and how do you adopt quickly to that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, by and large, acquiring meaningful data and keeping a constant check on their ROI itself is surely a, a critical aspect, and it also depends on the category, seasonality, and things like that. Right. So. It, it it becomes important to understand what to look out, you know, for from from the competitor data. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Robert. So, uh, Arok, uh, so just moving on to you. Uh, so, with with uh, competitor benchmarking and and price uh, optimization being one of the key focus areas for retailers, what what would be some integration touch points that the platform would uh, feed into uh, like ERP point of sale and things like that, uh, enabling seamless price automation. If you can talk about that, you know, that would be good. Right. Uh, so uh, if if we have ERP systems in place, uh, systems like SAP, Salesforce, and and the like, uh, I think these these systems offer. Uh, quite uh, extensive and comprehensive uh, API management services, uh, API integrations, uh, and uh, there are numerous OData integrations uh, that can be done using uh, these uh, applications. Uh, uh, if we particularly speak about SAP itself, uh, SAP has uh, a plethora of uh, tools available uh, that uh, offer a seamless integration into their platform. Uh, we uh, particularly ourselves have worked with one such uh, a uh, tool called SAP HANA in the past, uh, which allows us to seamlessly uh, change the prices of uh, products on the go and upload it directly onto the platform. Uh, and uh, Salesforce also has its own set of uh, tools uh, that allows us to do this. Uh, but also uh, there are other uh, uh, clients of ours that uh, want us to uh, deliver uh, only the prices and the recommendations to them uh, via API. So they make an API call into our system and uh, uh, our system in turn uh, delivers the uh, pricing recommendations to them. So we have backend APIs available as well uh, that directly integrate into the system. And uh, some 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 other people uh, they want to review the prices before they go into the system. So uh, they uh, just tell us, you know what, just just give us a few flat files, uh, upload it into an FTP server, an S3 bucket, and uh, we will. Uh, uh, review the prices and uh, override uh, some of the prices if we feel that uh, certain prices need to be overridden because uh, some some people are uh, uh, they, they're highly sensitive about uh, not uh, being able to not not uh, being able to uh, sell a particular product beyond a particular uh, discount or over uh, price a particular product so 
uh, we definitely take all of these constraints into account while pricing uh, while providing a price but uh, uh, some people would definitely want to review this before uh, implementing these onto their platforms as well so in certain scenarios people would just tell us you know what just give us flat files we want to review the prices uh, again if if it is uh, within the limits of them reviewing it uh, they do that and they upload it on the, onto their platforms but of course if there are uh, thousands of products uh, for whose uh, prices needs to be um, it needs to be updated dynamically uh, we have uh, apis built in that integrate directly with their uh, uh native systems with their uh, uh system and uh integrates it uh, uh directly into their uh, apis and we are able to directly upload the prices onto the platform okay that's great thanks Taruk, uh, for that quick insight um now in the interest of time i will also open the floor for any questions from the audience uh audience please post your questions if you have anything and uh, our panel can address your questions Right. So while while we wait for uh, questions from the audience, um, uh, Kishore, uh, can you elaborate on uh, uh, our dynamic pricing, where in addition to competitive position, you know, or or you also leverage market drivers and expected demand, right, in order to develop an accurate pricing model? Can you can you throw some light on that? Yeah. So as I mentioned, our uh, sort of uh, uh, you know. Our point of view is that that market-driven dynamic pricing is going to, uh, you know, be at the forefront. Um, so, you know, using a combination of rules like like the way Robert mentioned, minimum margins, maximum margins, parity, or a certain um, comparison with pack sizes, comparison with brands. Uh, so, uh, I, I like the way you mentioned it. That you have several rules, and there's any rules that are being um, conflicted, then it throws up an alert. I, I like that, the way you explained it. So then applying certain rules, um, and then you're able to arrive at uh, a price. Um, so the, the price is not so much determined by a price elasticity curve as, as much it is by uh, your own pricing, your initial pricing, uh, as well as the information you see around. Uh, also additionally, how do you incorporate factors for how do you incorporate local events, national events, Memorial Day, how do you incorporate, obviously, Easter, Christmas, how do you sort of, uh, you know, the build up to the event and thereafter the drop off. So that sort of keeps happening from event to event. And obviously, some events are much bigger than the other. Some events are local, there's a local ball game. You know, how do you model that into the demand for uh, the demand around that catchment area? It could be by state or it could be by county. How do you model that? Uh, so modeling all of that to account for the demand is is an interesting exercise. So we're all exciting times for uh, for 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 pricing. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks, Kishore. Robert, do you want to add anything here? Yeah, I mean, I guess I've talked about the sort of um, the structure of how we go about dynamic pricing in my my very long answer earlier. Um, I think the thing to be aware of is it's it's so easy um, just to to say it's all about margin. You know, it's it's all about maximizing the margin. And and it, it you know, a part of me says it would be lovely if the world's like that. But you have to retain a brand image for your you know. So, so for us, um, we we operate predominantly under the the spa banner. Um, so you want to make sure that you're protecting the the image of the organisation as well. So it would be, you know, especially in the convenience marketplace. So I think worldwide there tends to be a reputation that that people will, uh, will will charge you extra if they can get away with it. And I think we try and avoid that in the spa world. So I think you can always you, you can also use dynamic pricing around trying to make sure that you have, um, you know, loyal loyal customers. We very much see ourselves as part of the community in terms of the way we operate in our our urban and and. Um, and more local type areas. Um, so it's important that that the community sees you as as yes, you might be more expensive than Aldi, but you know you, you're not going to such an extreme that that you're robbing them really. So I think it's very important to make sure that you get that right balance between um, you know the dynamism of the price for is it a fair price, but also is it a price that's also making you profit as a business. So I'd, I'd overlay that as quite an important point for us anyway. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm very. I'm, I'm, I really want to sort of come in and add the perspective. The dynamic pricing does not mean that we are zipping off our customers. 
uh, in fact during the pandemic there were there were some retailers who increased their prices four five six fold and there's some that said this is the price we're going to sell it come what may and those are the retailers that retained the image as ethical proper you know uh, retailers so dynamic pricing does not mean either you rush to the bottom because others are charging less or um, you know you sort of you quote so you raise your prices that's not that's I not agree. the point I, I agree. it's getting the right balance yes i wonderfully put robert yeah and uh, that brings us a curious question here you know there is a question um, so maybe robert you want to uh, take this um, so what data are you able to capture in the context of dynamic pricing and what sources they come from Okay, well, that, the source of those data are, are managed by our trading analysts, so I'm afraid I can't give you the, the detail behind that. Um, what we do get is we will get we will take as much product comparative pricing as we can. There are agencies in the UK who specialise in that area for retail pricing, especially in the grocery marketplace. So we, we buy the data um, from those agencies. Um, you know, to, to how dynamic is it in terms of speed? Um, you know, with dynamism and the speed aspect, um, it varies from from multiple times a week to possibly some of the products might be more than a week old, which which is a risk and a danger. Um, so we buy that data in for our retail business and we'll buy it from wherever we can. Um, in terms of the wholesale, much harder. So we tend to rely on um, intelligence within our own business to try and understand um, the wholesale pricing. I mean, in the in the early days, everybody posted their prices on websites. You know, I think a new industry started up with scraping prices, but people are a lot more a lot more clever at, 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 at uh, protecting from that now. So you do for wholesale data, we do rely on um, internal resources to capture that information. But retail, we do buy it from agencies. Wonderful. Um, so here, there's another question. Um, do you, do you want to uh, talk about the tools you use for data optimization and intelligence? Maybe, you know, Taruk, you want to take it? Uh, sure, uh, Girish. So with respect to external data, incorporating external data, uh, we extensively uh, rely on a lot of open data sets that are already available out there uh, that give us information on uh, the demography, the census, uh, understanding uh, what do uh, uh, land area dem demography look uh, look like. Uh, we also uh, get, uh, have our own data sets with respect to uh, the area with, re with regards to the establishments that are present in a particular area. We, uh, we, po we perform something called as a trade area analysis, wherein we look at uh, the uh, type of establishments uh, that are particular to a uh, that are uh, specific to a particular category being present in an area. Like, for example, if you are working with restaurants, uh, we look at a particular locality and we get information on all of the restaurants that are available in that particular area. Uh, we also look at the spending power, the uh, spending uh, power of uh, the customers in a particular locality, of the population in, the, in a particular locality. We look at spending patterns. We look at point of interest data. Uh, we also leverage uh, other tools like uh, Safecraft, uh, for example, uh, to get all of this information and uh, derive insights from these uh, data sets that we are able to source from uh, these third party uh, companies and uh, leverage all of that information into our models. Perfect. Uh, Robert, uh, do you see anything else that, that could be used or you leverage we, uh, anything else? It'd probably be unfair to name the. Excuse me. Um, probably unfair to me to name the organisation, um, the product we use, but I, I guess you know we could ask their permission and, and perhaps leave with you guys at JKT. But we uh, we have a product, it's software as a service product that we um, that, that we we entered into arrangements with, like I say, about eighteen months ago. Perhaps a little bit longer now. Um, it's it's a product that um, that takes feeds from the third parties we talked about earlier. But also from the, in our own systems to get the, the the sales, the demand, the product information, the product details. Um, so we use a, a specific product which does um, the forecasting. You enter the rule sets, 
it spits out the um, it spits out the the alerts, um, and we will use it for the more sophisticated analysis going forward as well. Um, it is it is fully embedded, um, fully integrated with our enterprise solutions, um, and it takes feeds from and to our pod solutions as well, which generally are fed through the enterprise anyway. Um, and so it is it is the screens that our trading floor uses, and the trading floor are the people who manage our our range and prices. They predominantly are sat in the screens of that product, um, so it's fully embedded in our business. Perfect. Thanks, Robert. This uh, next next question we have here: How how do you ensure data quality while you deal with so many variety of data? Maybe Kishore, you want to address this? That would be good. Yeah. Um... Data quality is the prime most issue because then as you're getting data from a variety of sources, um, you know, there's just, just so many companies out there that do web scraping. They're, 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 they're rare by the diamond dozen. So they pull data, they dump it, and they give it to you. But does it make business sense? Is, is, a, is it semantically okay? Are they structured right? You know, if there's a product code, there's an EN code, is the EN code the right, I mean, is it a proper EN code? So I think that's that's where the data quality is, is are the records right, are the fields right, does it make sense, or does it say something absurd? Uh, I mean, there's like a jam is 999 pounds, does it make sense? Um, so, so I think wherever you get your data from, um, you gotta make sure that it's structured, it represents something real, and it says something which is of value. And then only then can we use it for further action. So to that you to take it through a variety of processes, uh, cleansing, structuring, annotating, removing extremities, um, and, and then it's sort of um, uh, available for action. Otherwise, it, it can lead you astray. You use the data in your, in your uh, enterprise automation, you you could somebody will get fired. I'm telling you. So that's why that that cleansing is very important, which is why you, you just can't rely on a web scraper, right? You got to do a lot more work before the data becomes information. That's wonderfully well, you know. That's really wonderful. Uh, while we wait for uh, more questions, um... sorry, Garish, just to add to to the comment there, I think you also need to consider. Um, I think we were talking about the external data there. In terms of your internal data, it's um, I think part of that is an organisational challenge. So because you have to retain that diligence and accuracy. Um, so can you make can you can you build products and tools and portals and agree with your suppliers that they will self serve to put in the information directly, which minimises then the chance for errors as things get translated as they and, and rekeyed. Um, have you got your organisation right? Do you have a team of people who are dedicated to making sure that that data is input correctly indeed are they the data inputters potentially you know does it pass through does it pass through you know somebody who's responsible and then some for for, for the definition then somebody who's responsible for the for the um setup so that you have that that separation of, of responsibility so um but it is about diligence and accuracy and for me getting that right is as much about organization and and determining who does what Yeah, absolutely. So, Robert, I, I have a, a curious question there. You know? So, what would be the best way to measure the returns on your data-related investments? So, how, how would you adopt it? Well, it, it's so easy to talk about just percentage margins, um, but the, the problem there is, is whilst it, we'd all love to have percentage margins as high as we possibly can, what's the impact on your um, on your long-term turnover what's the impact on on the image so i think you start with percentage margins but then you have to look at how that's affecting your your um, total sales and therefore your total margins and you need your colleagues and friends in marketing to really try to um, find a way of of monitoring the um, you know the, the, the brand scoring for, for for your organization as a whole um, because getting pricing wrong especially in the grocery and, and convenience marketplace 
can can be very dangerous very quickly. And like I say, we're committed to making sure that we have the right price for our communities. And, and how long does it usually take to realize, you know, these benefits in your experience? I think we are just starting to see the benefits coming through now. Um, and that's 12 months later from when we really started using the product in any sort of anger. Okay. Okay. But remember that is a big implementation with, with a lot of, um, cultural and people change within there as well. I think the example that Tarut gave, I would expect that to be a much shorter time scale because it's, there's fewer people involved. It's an online type capability and less complex business. Understood. Yeah. I think we, we have one one last question. Looks like uh, let's take this one last question. How how can technology be used to uh, reduce and manage data overload uh, without uh, compromising on the outcomes? Any of you can take this. I don't quite understand the question. I'm sorry. Do you want to say, say it again? Girish, can you say it again? How can technology be used to reduce and manage data overload without compromising on the outcomes? Yeah, that's that's what technology is all about, right? Uh, you have wonderful infrastructure nowadays. You have uh, uh, MPPs, massively parallel processing data warehouses, very high speed appliances that can store a lot of data. Then you have um, huge, I mean, powerful tools can structure, uh, you know, quality check the data, applying various rules. And then you can do a variety of summarizations, a variety of uh, insights. You can get a variety of uh, you know alerts from there. Um, so that's the whole point of technology, right? So you use technology to be able to simplify, structure, reduce the errors, and make value come out of data. That's that's the whole point of technology. Absolutely. Thank you, Kishore. I think we are just uh, about uh, two minutes short. So there are no more questions coming in. So I think we are just on top of the hour. So I think I think it is time to wrap up the session. Um, so I I would like to uh, thank all the participants for joining us in this uh, discussion today, and uh, we hope it was quite insightful. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Robert, for accepting our invite and uh, being with us in this event, uh, despite your. Uh, a busy schedule and uh, sharing really uh, interesting and uh, thoughtful perspectives. And also thank you uh, Kishore and Tarup for your wonderful insights on this uh, uh, key topic as always. And finally, you know, thank you uh, marketing team and others who supported in making this event a great success. I uh, look forward to meeting you all in our next uh, webinar. Uh, please visit our uh, website, uh, jktech.com uh, to know more about our uh, upcoming events uh, or, or access our uh, uh, thought leadership uh, content. Um, so thanks again. Uh, have a good one, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye.